Well, good evening. Welcome everybody to Guest Baptist Church. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or watching it here a little later, we had a little trouble with the Facebook Live tonight, so uh, y'all have to catch this on YouTube. Uh, again, uh, those of you who may be watching from home or watching at a later time, we want to invite you to come be a part of the church uh, and join us for our services that we have. We'd be glad to have you uh, come and uh, join us anytime. Uh, right now we're doing a study in the book of Galatians, and I got another week or maybe two in this study uh, that we're talking about the book of Galatians where Paul has, a, uh, has to defend the gospel because there are those who want to add to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They want to say that in addition to being saved by grace and believing in Jesus Christ that you have to keep the law on top of that, that you have to do all of the rules and regulations and, and all of those things that the Jews were required to do. And, and he argues in the book of Galatians that this is not so and not the way it should be. So tonight we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3. If you'd like to join me there, I'm going to read several verses. I've got quite a few verses to actually read tonight, uh, so we're going to have to move through this uh, uh, some of it pretty quickly. Galatians 3, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, this day, and Lord, we're just so thankful to be in this place tonight. Lord God, I just thank you for your word, and Lord, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would come down tonight, Lord, and, and when we meet together, Lord, you've promised to be there in the midst of us, and I just promise that, or ask that you would do that tonight, Lord. Just be in the midst of us tonight, Lord. Help your Spirit reveal to us the things that we need to see in this word. Lord God, I just confess my sins before you now and my shortcomings and failures. Lord, just cleanse me and help me to be able to clear my mind and, Lord, to be able to share what it is that we've studied this week. Lord God, I just want you to be honored and glorified. Lord, I pray for this church, Lord, that we would all, Lord, live for you and that we might shine our light the way that we should to reach the lost world out there. Uh, and, and, Lord, just help us to be able to do that, to surrender to you, Lord, and to be the lights we need to be. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So last time, if you'll remember, we talked about how the gospel of grace has gone out to the Gentiles. And when the King James uses that word Gentiles, what it means is the other nations who are not Jews. So the gospel had first been presented to the Jews or to Israel, and then later it would go to the Gentiles and it would go to all the other uh, nations and and this is a big step that this gospel of grace has been made available to all people we're going to see tonight that that was promised to Abraham over in Genesis chapter 12 but it didn't actually come to fruition and take place until we see what has uh, happened on up um, uh, into Paul being called and different things into the book of Acts anyway but after the first missionary journey we said that Paul and Barnabas went by revelation to Jerusalem and when it said by revelation, that means that it was by God calling them and the Holy Spirit sending them that they went to talk to the Jews about the gospel they were preaching 
amongst the Gentiles. Now, Peter had also had an experience with some Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit at Cornelius' house. So remember, they all went, Paul and Barnabas and Peter, and then everybody in the Jerusalem church went to be able to what we call now the Jerusalem Council to be able to talk about this, the gospel going to the Gentiles. And no doubt that the gospel that was given by revelation of Jesus Christ to Paul uh, is seeing Gentiles converted. There, there's no doubt of that because Paul brought proof with him in the person of Titus. Titus was brought with him, a, a Greek who was uncircumcised, one who had believed in Jesus and had received the Holy Spirit. But there were Jews there who wanted to hold on to the tradition of their fathers. They wanted to keep doing all of those things that the law had commanded. They wanted the Gentiles also to submit to this law. But it says that Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. And Titus didn't feel like he needed to follow after the law. You know, he had been saved by grace through faith. And he didn't feel like he needed to add anything to that or anything in addition to that in order to be saved. But there's two systems that were debated at this Jerusalem council. One was law and the other we call grace. And these two things are in conflict. You can't take grace and you can't add the law to it because remember Paul tells us over there that if you take grace and you try and add anything else to it, then you get something that is a religion of works. It is something that is no gospel at all. It is not good news to tell man that he has to work for his salvation because we know that that doesn't work. If we could work for our salvation, then we wouldn't need Christ. It is only through what Christ has done that we are able to be justified. So anyone who preaches otherwise and says that you have to work for your salvation, Paul says, let them be accursed. If they're adding anything to the gospel of grace, let those people be accursed. But Paul argues before the council, and he argues before Peter personally, that no flesh will be justified by the law. It is only through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by believing in that, that a man can be saved, or a person can be justified, or, or declared righteous, or, or made right with God, however we choose to say that. See, salvation is something that is spiritual. It's a spiritual thing that takes place. It's not about the rules and all of that kind of stuff. Paul told us we're crucified with Christ. That is, we die to sin, we die to ourself, and we are raised by the Spirit to walk in newness of life. After salvation, we live differently than we did before because of the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us. See, the law did nothing to change us. The law did nothing to change men's hearts. The law was only good to be able to condemn you or to be able to show you your sin. That's what the law did. We talked last time about the speed limit sign. Remember, y'all laughed at me for my example of the speed limit sign. But here you go. You've got the sign that says, here's the line. Don't cross it. But we've all crossed it. We've all broken the line. We've all crossed the line. We've all gone farther than we should have went. We have all sinned, Scripture says. And the problem is with our hearts. It's our hearts that need to be changed. The law's perfect, right? The sign's fine. When it says 55, that's what it's supposed to be. The problem's with our hearts and our desire to go out and to be able to break the law. The real issue has to do with men's hearts. And the law doesn't address men's hearts it is only grace through faith and the Holy Spirit that can come and change our hearts. When Paul uses this Greek word foolish, it means unintelligent, but with this implication, and this is, this is interesting, the idea that they are foolish because they follow the sensual. They are unwise to follow the flesh. Did you know that it's unwise to follow after the flesh? I'll tell you tonight, it's, it's unwise for us to follow after the flesh because flesh and sin are very much about instant gratification. It's about us getting what we want right now. It, it, it's just what I want right now with no regard to any consequences of what's going to happen down the road or anything like that. No real regard for others and no real regard for God. It's about fulfilling the lust and the desires of our flesh, and it's about what it is that we really want, and we don't really care how that affects you, and we don't care how it affects anybody else. If I have to steal to get it, I'll steal to get what I want right now. If I have to kill to get it, I'll kill to get what I want right now. If I want to not feel this way anymore, I'll go get high. I'll do whatever I have to do to be able to 
fulfill this lust or desire of the flesh that I have right now. Forget the consequences. Forget judgment. Forget God. Forget my neighbor. Forget everybody else. It's about what I want right now. We, as Christians, should be led by the Spirit, is what Paul says. We're not led by our fleshly desires, but we are to be led by the Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit, Paul says they are sons of God. If you're led by the Spirit, that's what identifies you as one who is a, a son of God. So I'm going to ask you tonight, what are you being led by? What are you being led by? Because too many people, even in the church, I believe, many times are being led by their sensual or their fleshly desires. And this is unwise as a Christian because for one thing, the first thing it does is destroy your fellowship. Is that you can't have fellowship with God if you're walking in sin. See, that has to be confessed and it has to be dealt with and you have to walk in the light as he is in the light if we are to have fellowship with one another and that's what it tells us in the book of 1 John. So the first thing that you lose whenever you decide to walk according to the flesh is your fellowship. But another thing you lose is that, is that you lose your ability to witness to anyone whenever you're living for the flesh and not living for the Holy Spirit. See, it keeps us from sharing our faith because last time, remember, we said we're afraid we're going to be exposed if we go out and, and we try and witness to somebody and we're not living the way that we should. See, it keeps us from sharing our faith. Scripture tells us that there was nothing wrong with the law. There was nothing wrong with the rules. It was holy and righteous. It was given by God. It was perfect, in fact. But the problem is man's ability to keep it. That is where we come into trouble. And that's where the flesh comes in. The flesh, it turns out, is the weak link in the whole system of, of why we can't be made perfect by the law or why we can't be made perfect by keeping the law. The flesh refers to in Scripture as our sinful nature. It, it is our sinful nature, it tells us, and it always goes back to an inherited nature that has been passed down to us from Adam. So there is a genetic aspect to it. And some people would argue this and say there's not a genetic aspect. Well, how then is sin passed down if it is not passed down in the form of our flesh and, and, and all of these things? So there is a genetic aspect to sin. And I teach this this way. We are sinners by nature. And that is a nature that has been passed down from Adam. All have sinned because we are born with a sin nature. But also we are sinners by choice. See, if we were sinners only by nature, then it would give you an out and it would give you an excuse. And you could say, well, I was born this way and I didn't have any chance but to sin. That's, that's all I could do was sin. I, I, I was born this way. I was born with a sin nature. But the truth of the matter is, is that all have chosen to sin. So we were born with a sin nature. All choose to sin and we have no excuses when it comes to the law. No one is able to escape the condemnation. Nobody gets a free pass because we're all guilty. We are all guilty and we are all under condemnation. And we need Jesus Christ. We need him. That's what we need. It's the only way to deal with our sins is to be able to get Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know that any of us would argue that sin is unwise tonight, that it's unwise for us to live our lives that way, yet here we are continuing to do the same things that we've always done many times. And I'm talking about Christian people, that we repeat the same destructive patterns over and over, even though they keep leading us to places that we know we shouldn't be. But yet here we are, we keep following after the ways of the flesh rather than surrendering ourselves to the Spirit in the way that we should. Why do we do this? I believe Paul tells the Galatians, he tells them down there, he says, you've been bewitched. You've been bewitched. He said, you started out on the right path. You started out with salvation by grace through faith. He said, but something's happened. You've been bewitched. There's something that has, has happened to you. you this, there's been a hex or, or there's been a spell of some kind that's been put on us. That's what, he's, that's what that means. See, at that time people were very superstitious. And the idea behind being bewitched was that somebody would put the evil eye on you or give you the evil eye or something like that, you know. I don't know exactly how we would, we would say that today, but, but somebody's put a curse on you, a hex of some kind, and you've been deceived, you've been, you, you've been led astray. And the result is that there's a disobedience to the truth. When you get bewitched, all of a sudden you're not obeying the truth that you know is supposed to be the truth. You're doing things that are contrary to what you truly believe you should, you know, or know that you should be doing, right? You see where I'm getting at with this? Doesn't that sound like the church today? 
We've been deceived. We've been bewitched. There's been some kind of hex put on us. There's so much disobedience to the word going on in the local churches today. Why is that? We've been bewitched. You say, well, how exactly has the church been bewitched? You know, there's a whole lot of people who think they can just show up on Sunday morning and they've done their whole of the Christian duty and that's all they're supposed to do. If you believe that, you've been bewitched. You, you've been bewitched. You've been led astray. You, you, you've been deceived in, in some way. You know, there's a whole lot of people that think being a cheerful giver means I just write my check every week and it doesn't have anything to do with giving of yourself or your time and your talents. See, if you believe that, that all you got to do is write the check every week and you're good, you're a legalist. That's what that's all about. You've been bewitched. You've not believed the truth. If you think it's the pastor's job and the Sunday school teacher's job to train up your children, let me tell you, you've been bewitched. It's your job to train your children, to be able to train them up in the way that they should go. If you think somebody else is going to invite your neighbor to church, let me tell you, you've been bewitched. The devil's lied to you. He's put a hex on you and said, oh, yeah, you don't have to go there. They're, they ain't coming anyway, so don't worry about it. Don't go knock on their door, right? You think a little sin won't hurt nobody, a little white lie, it's okay. It don't really matter how we live. If you believe that, you've been bewitched. You've been led astray and you've been deceived. You know, one of the things that we like to do in this generation is we want to blame the devil for everything. We want to blame the devil and say, oh, the devil's to blame and, and all of that. But you know what that does? It takes a responsibility off of me. If the devil's to blame, what, what responsibility do I have in any of this? Because the real blame lies with me, right? I mean, I'm the one who's failed and, and come up short, and I'm the one who, who sins, and, and that applies to each of us because all have sinned, right? We've, we've already established in, in all of this. See, it gets back to the idea that the weak link in all of this is the flesh. It's, it's this stuff right here. It's, it's our sinful nature that's carried around in our, in our fleshly bodies. It all gets back to that. And what we need is we need a spiritual transaction. We need to be born again of the Spirit. And when we get born again of the Spirit, all of a sudden, you will have a new nature. Paul says, Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth before you as crucified. This means clearly Christ has been crucified, and there's no denying that. I heard somebody say one time that this has been billboarded. That's what he says. There's been a billboard thrown up with the statement on it, Christ has been crucified for you. Nobody can deny it. Nobody can, you know, in any way say it. You can't miss the sign because the sign was that he hung on the cross and he bled and he died for us, right? See, there's no mistake in that. that, that we, we know that. There's, there's no deceit. deceit. Clearly we understand what Christ has done. But yet still, knowing what Christ has done, we are still led away into sin sometimes. It's a vicious cycle. We can't get ourselves out of it, right? Even with the best intentions as a Christian, we go forth into our day and next thing you know, here we've said something, we've thought something, we've done something, and next thing you know, we've slipped off into sin, right? That's why we need Jesus. It's because we don't have the power. He has the power. That's where the power comes from. Even after salvation, we need His power to endure temptation. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to help us, to be able to stand strong in this world. If we're going to put off the old man and we're going to put on the new man, if we're going to put on the armor of God, all of these things that Paul talks about, we need Jesus. And it's a battle every day between our flesh and between our spirit. It's a battle that goes on. Doesn't it feel like a battle to you? I mean, some days it feels like I'm getting just punched all around a boxing ring, right? I mean... I mean, I'm just getting wore out some days. It feels like it with the, the battle that seems to be going on. But our sanctification, our being made into the image of Christ, this battle we're going through will not be complete until we leave this body of death, Paul tells us. Until we leave this body, this flesh, once this flesh drops and we leave this flesh behind, our sanctification is going to be complete. You know, we want to do good. Y'all turn with me to Romans 7, if you will. We, we want to do good, don't we? I mean, I mean, most people, we want to please God and do good, but the problem is we can't do good for very long. It just doesn't seem to stick with us for very long. We just can't, can't keep it up. And the problem 
has to do uh, with our flesh. Romans chapter 7, these are going to be familiar verses, but I want to read these to you. Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law was spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul says with the flesh... We serve the law of sin, and it condemns us. The things we do in our flesh condemns us. After conversion, after being born again, there is another law that is present in our members, and it is the law of righteousness by faith. And what that does is makes us right with God. It, by, by faith, we are made right with God. We, we are declared righteous. But too many try and compare these things, flesh and spirit, and they get all twisted up and intertwined together when they're really two different things and they are at odds with one another and they are contrary to one another. Paul will refer to these as law and faith or law and grace. And the two things are on opposing ends of the spectrum. They, 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 you can't join them together and get one thing that is still salvation. You have to separate the two and look at law and salvation only comes by grace. So which do the Galatians want to surrender to? Do they want to surrender to the law? Or do they want to surrender to grace? First off, he says, how did you receive the Spirit? How did you receive the Spirit? Was it by the works of law? Or was it through the hearing of faith? Did they do right things and keep the rules and, and, and get made right with God? Or did they believe that they were sinners and they come and believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and what he had done for them? See the difference? The law is about the rules. And faith is all about faith, or grace is all about faith. The law says, I can earn my way. I, 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 can, I can get there. I can, I can jump far enough. I can do good enough. I can be good enough. I can, I can do all of these things and feel good about myself because I've, I've done so good, right? Now, I may not keep all the points of the law, but most of those things I do pretty good at, right? And, and it gives us a sense of pride. See, that's a trap. It's a trap when you say, oh, yeah, I'm doing 99% of the things well, but this one thing I'm not doing so well, right? Remember when the rich young ruler come to Jesus? He was sure he was doing it right. He fully expected when he said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He fully expected, I believe, Jesus to say, oh, you're doing good, right? You're doing good because Jesus starts naming all of these laws and the Ten Commandments and, and he says, oh, I've kept all of those since my youth, right? I've kept all of them. And then Jesus says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And all of a sudden it says that he went away sorrowful. He had to go away sorrowful because there was one sin in his flesh that he'd not been able to master. See, he'd mastered all the others. He, 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 he was good at those, but he had not been able to master greed. And greed had got root down in his heart, and Jesus knew it and called him out on it. And he went away sorrowful because he wasn't willing to give away what he had to be able to follow after Jesus. I bet he is proud of himself all over all them things that he good, did good, right? Oh, he's real proud of himself. There, there's just this one thing, and we, we don't talk about that one thing. Which I'm, I'm proud of myself for all this, 
is good I'm doing right. Let's, let's just forget this other. Let's not worry about it. You know, each of us has things that we don't struggle with. There's things we probably never cross our mind or, or we never struggle with. But each of us probably also has one point that we fall for over and over and over and over again. It's like the devil has your number and all he's got to do is push the button and you'll fall for it, right? Is that anybody else or is it just me? He, he knows. And all he's got to do when he wants to defeat you or get you weak or get you down or get you take, try and take your power away from you, he'll just he'll come and, and lay it out there and push that button knowing you're going to fall for it every time, right? What we do is we try and compare ourselves to others. They're only doing 80% right, and I'm doing 95% right, so therefore I'm higher on the rung than they are, right? Everything's, everything's good and everything's fine. I try to be more righteous to the, than them. But we come to Jesus only by faith and not by works. If you've offended at any one point of the law, you're guilty of it all, it tells us there in Scripture. If you're going to be right with God, it will only come through faith in Jesus Christ. It will not come by any works of your own. Paul says it would be unwise for you to begin in the Spirit and then try to be made perfect by the flesh. That doesn't even make sense if the flesh is the weak link in the whole thing that you could somehow do enough or, or be good enough, right? But this was their error that they believed salvation by grace, but they could earn their salvation or keep their salvation or be secure by the, by the keeping of the law or by wanting to be a Jew. You know, we, we want to keep the rules. I, I, I believe we really do want to keep the rules. But sanctification has to come by the Spirit. It's not about us just keeping the rules and doing right things, but sanctification has to come by the Spirit. In Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus Christ has perfected forever them that are sanctified, is what the, is what the verse says. By, by offering his blood, by what Christ did for us, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering, you have been perfected Forever, The Spirit has been given. Your sins have been forgiven. You have been cleansed. And it says that there is no more offering needed for sin. And what that means is that there's no need to offer anything else because Christ has already paid it all. There's no point in going back to the law and sacrificing a bull or a goat or a turtle dove because Christ has already paid the total amount of your sin debt that, that, that was due. He, he paid the whole bill. You know, if you paid your last payment on your truck down there at the credit union, you wouldn't show up next month and try to make another payment, would you? No. When you, boy, when you get that, that empty book, boy, you're done with it. You, there's no, you're free, right? No more payments. See, Christ said it's free. We don't have to show up and, and kill the little lambs and all of that and, and do all of those things at the temple that the Jews were having to do. But not only that did Christ set us free, but he's willing to give us a new heart. He's willing to give us a new heart. He's willing to see us perfected forever. We are sanctified. That is, that you are perfected forever when you come believing, but yet sanctification must still be worked out in your life. It is something that we have to work out as we go through, uh, uh, through our lives. Paul says, he that has ministered to you the Spirit and works miracles, is he doing that by the law or by the hearing of faith? You notice most of the time when he asks these questions, there's no answer because the answer is obvious. It's obvious that it is by the Spirit he's doing these things. And then he gives us an example that is going to carry on through through the end of chapter 5. And I've got some lofty goals to get through some of this tonight, but... But, uh, but it's, uh, it's Galatians 3, 6, even though I've not, I read it a minute ago, but that's where we are. It says, Abraham believed God and, was count, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And it tells us in Scripture that those that are uh, uh, of faith are the children of Abraham and that any who come in faith are Abraham's seed. Now we need to understand that does not mean that we are Jews. It means that we are of the seed of faith. It doesn't mean that we are Jews. But in the promise that was given to Abraham, there was a promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And this is important 
uh, for us to understand faith in Christ and the way that our salvation comes about. We need to understand the way that Abraham got saved because we will get saved the same way by faith. And we need to see that the promise originally given to Abraham still is ringing true today and it affects us. So that's why I want you to see in Genesis chapter 12, I need to read you a few verses. Hold your place in Galatians. We'll be back in just a minute. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. There's the promise. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So the Lord told Abraham, he said, get out of your father's house, leave the country that you're in, and I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you. And Abraham left not knowing where he was going. Just in faith, he left and he went to be able to go exactly where it was uh, he didn't know would be going. Now, most of us wouldn't do that, right? I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go put a for sale sign in my yard without already having something lined up going somewhere else, you know, and... And maybe a house lined up to move into. I wouldn't just pack up my tent and, and head out and say, okay, God, tell me when to stop. But that's what Abraham did. He left everything that he knew and he set out to be able to go and let God lead him where he wanted him to be able uh, to go. You know, a similar thing, and, uh, and I'm not comparing myself to Abraham in any way, but uh, I want to tell this again because we have the trip to Belize coming up. But it happened to me that night. We went to the meeting about Belize. John said, hey, you know, we're, we're you know, thinking about going to Belize and all of that. And uh, we went to that meeting and we were expecting to get details and here's where we're going to stay and here's what we're going to preach and here's what we're going to do and all of these details. And he didn't even hardly talk about the trip at all at the meeting that we went to. We got no details about the meeting. And I sat in the back of John's truck and John, John Fowler was in there too. He probably heard me say it. I sat in the back of his truck and I said, I am not the kind of person that can commit to this kind of a thing without knowing what it is we're going to be teaching and what we're going to be doing and all of that kind of stuff. And I went home that night and did not sleep. And the Lord said, don't you trust me to make a way? Don't you trust me to provide the way? If I say go, then, then does it really matter what you're going to be doing when you get there? If I say go? And the next morning I committed to the trip not knowing what the details were. Abraham went in faith. He didn't know none of the details. He didn't have any idea what was going on. He went in faith. But if he would go, God would do certain things. It was a conditional thing. He had to go in order for God to do his part, right? It was a conditional covenant. Had Abraham stayed at his father's house and stayed in his father's country, then God would never have done the things that he said he would do. He had to step out in faith in order to be able to go. He said he'd make him a great nation. Now, wait a minute. We know that it tells us in Genesis that his wife, Sarai, was barren. How's he going to make him a great nation if, if she's barren? I mean, I know you're God, but, but I need to know how this is going to work, right? Don't we like to know how? Boy, we like to know how, don't we? We like to know why. Lord, if, Lord, if you'll just tell me how or tell me why or... We got all these questions. Why can't we just trust him? Why can't we just let him lead us and, and follow where he wants us to go? You know, last time we said that Peter did not withstand God whenever the Holy Spirit come upon the Gentiles. Well, you know what? Neither did Abraham. Abraham didn't withstand God. God said, I'm going to do all of these things. And they were saying, okay, let's go. And he just went, right? He didn't question. He didn't ask. I believe that if God says he's going to make me the father of a great nation, then, then that's, that's the way it's going to be. I just, I just believe that, right? And God said, I'm going to bless you. He said, I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless those that bless you, and I'm going to curse those that curse you. And here it is. He says, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All the families. See, that's me and you. That's the gospel of grace going to the Gentiles. 
as it was we talked about it here in the book of Galatians. That's the gospel of grace going to the Gentiles. See, it was a messianic promise that through faith like Abraham had, all people and all nations would be able to come to God. And here it is in Genesis 12. All people, all nations are going to be able to come to God. People from every tongue, tribe, and nation, it tells us in the scripture. Because the law had not been given. And Paul tells us in, the, in Galatians, he says, it was 430 years before the law was given that Abraham had this promise of faith. See, it was 430 years before the law. Now the Jews are going to get the law and they're going to try and keep the law and they're going to do all of that and they're going to fail. And that's evident because of the rivers of blood that flowed from the altar all of them years and all of the sacrifices they had to give whenever they failed and, and weren't able to keep God's commandments and they went and offered the sacrifices. But the Jews waited on the anointed one. They waited on the Christ, the one who could come and finally deal with their sin. And as they waited, they become so legalistic and blind to the truth that by the time Jesus Christ showed up, they didn't recognize him. And they didn't see him or know who he was. But see, faith was never about being a Jew first. That's what Paul needs them to understand. You don't get saved and become a Jew or become a Jew and then get saved or, or none of those things. That's not how it works. It was about having faith like Abraham had. If you'll have faith tonight like Abraham had, believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins, you can be born again. You can have salvation. You can be made right with God, all your sins forgiven, gone away. You can have freedom in Christ, Paul tells us. Abraham was 75 years old when the promise come. He was 99 by the time Isaac was born. Sarah was barren. And the book of Hebrews said he was as good as dead. And God gave him a son. God gave him a son. But we don't like to wait on God, do we? We try to do things our way. Abraham's going to try and do things his way, and it's not going to work out. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 22 and 23. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by the promise. Abraham had two sons. One was Ishmael, who he and Sarai are exactly how it happened. They decided to be able to try and have a son with his Egyptian handmaiden, Hagar, because it had been, I believe, if I remember my math right, 12 or 13 years since the promise that God had given, and there was no seed, no child, so they tried to do this themselves. They go out, right? Remember, she was an Egyptian handmaiden. In Scripture, Egypt is always a picture of the world. When the Scripture says they went down to Egypt or this happened in Egypt, you need to be thinking about what they are doing down there because Egypt is always a picture of the world. But Ishmael was born to them and he was not the son of promise. He was not the one that God spoke about. But Isaac was the son of promise. So when Abram or Abraham is 99 years old, God again gives the promise and he confirms it with circumcision and Isaac was born. But it tells us that Abraham two, had two sons. One was of the flesh and one was of the promise or the spirit. Okay, do you see the two systems at law and grace? You have one of the flesh and you have one of the spirit. Galatians 4, 24. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. The two sons represent law and grace. They are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, and it was given to Moses, and it led them to bondage. And that is where the Jews stood in Paul's day, and it's where the Jews still stand today, is that they are bound by the law, and they are under condemnation. They are in bondage to the rules and the regulations of the law. But he says Jerusalem, which is above, 
is free. See, we are the children of promise. We who come and like faith, like Abraham, we are the children of promise. Now, there is error in saying that we have to be Jews in order to be free. We are not the true Israel. If you hear anybody teaching that we are the true Israel, turn it off. You, you need to stop. Don't listen anymore. They're teaching you error. It's called replacement theology is what it is. And all the promises to Israel will not be fulfilled in the church. The promises to Israel are going to be fulfilled to Israel. And they are earthly promises. The promises to the church, to the body of Christ, are heavenly spiritual promises that will only be revealed to those who were the mystery, the body of Christ that we've talked about with Paul, right? So this allegory actually stands to be able to prove that replacement theology is wrong because Abraham was justified before the law ever came to be. He was made right with God before the law ever came along. And it is Christ who would come through that lineage to be able to set us free from bondage. We are not the children of the bondwoman, but we are the children of the free. We are not bound by the law, but we are bound by faith in Christ. We are bound or constrained, we said a couple weeks ago, by the love uh, of Christ. And it points all the way back to Genesis 12 to this promise that all the families in the earth would be blessed through Abraham. Now, this allegory is interesting. It's interesting, and there's more to it than what I'm going to share with you tonight. But it's very interesting because it tells us that Abraham, over in Genesis over there, he believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So we would say Abraham saved. He's, he's as saved as he's going to be. He's as right with God as he's going to be. He believed God, and he was counted as righteous. But still, he tried to turn to the flesh, right? He still tried to do things his own way and be able to have a child, that child Ishmael, right? Because God's plans needed a little bit of help or, or God's timing needed some adjustment, right? We're all guilty of that, thinking that, well, we can rush God or, you know, or, or something like that. We do the wrong thing lots of times. But God has a proper time and he has a proper order. And you don't mess with God's time or you don't mess with God's order or things get out of whack and you miss the mark. See, that's what sin is, when you miss the mark. When you go messing with God's timing and his order and you try and rush things or, or do things, then all of a sudden you end up uh, having to bear the consequences of this bad fruit in your life because you've surrendered to the flesh and not to the spirit. See, Abraham would have to put away the flesh. Remember the story? He had to send Ishmael away. Why was that? There was a conflict. Remember, there was a conflict between Ishmael and between Isaac. You remember how Ishmael mocked Isaac? Ishmael mocked God's anointed. Paul tells us the flesh wars against the spirit. And we see it in that example. The flesh, Ishmael, the son of the flesh, versus the son of promise. And one had to be put away in order for the other to be able to rule. Paul said, there are two members at work in my body. Over in Romans 7, there are two members at war in my body. One leads to death and condemnation, and one leads to life. What are we going to surrender to? Are we going to surrender to the death, or are we going to surrender to the life? You know, the flesh is not willing to be in subjection. The flesh is going to rule. If the flesh is, is let to dominate, the flesh, the, flesh is going to, uh, uh, the flesh is going to rule. It serves itself. It doesn't serve God. It doesn't serve the Spirit. The flesh is contrary to the Spirit. And it is only through the Spirit that we can be made right with God or that we can put to death the deeds of the flesh. Because without the Spirit, the flesh is going to rule and reign without the Spirit to be able to try and rein it back in. As a Christian, let me tell you, you can't live both ways. They're contrary to one another. They're at war with one another. You, you can't live both ways. You will either be fleshly or you will be spiritual. 
You will not be both. You will be one or the other. You will be fleshly or you will be spiritual. And to the degree that you submit to one or the other, you will either be useless for Christ or you will be fruitful. One or the other. If you surrender to the flesh, you're going to be useless. And if you surrender to the Spirit, then you will be fruitful. You will either be a child of the bondwoman or you'll be a child of the free. See, when we understand this allegory, the offering of Isaac brings so much more to the table as far as our understanding and the significance of this. He was not just a son. It would be hard enough to be able to take your son and to be able to offer him on an altar if God told you to. But, but, but he wasn't just a son. See, in Isaac was all the promises of God. All the promises of God lay in that, that miracle child. Isaac that was there, all of his promises. See, Abraham tried the fleshly option, but it didn't work out. Does the fleshly option ever work for you? Don't, does it? Why do we keep going back to it? Why do we keep on going back to it, right? Ishmael had been sent away. And if Abraham was going to be a father of many nations, if all families of the earth were going to be blessed, it'd be through Isaac. And yet here he is on the altar, and Abraham's got his knife pulled back, and he's fixing to lay there, and, and he's, I, mean, I mean, he's already in swing, I think, is the way that I read it. I mean, he's already starting to come down, and, and, and something stops him, right? Total trust. Total surrender to God. He believed that God was going to take care of him and make them promises fulfilled regardless of what he had to do or how he had to do it. It didn't matter. God was going to take care of this. See, that's the kind of faith we need. We need to be totally surrendered to God. But what we do is we keep Ishmael lined up over here just in case this religious thing don't work out, right? So that way we can go back to the son of our flesh in case this other thing just don't quite, don't quite get it. See, the flesh always has a backup plan because it's about self-preservation. It's always taking care of self. That's why the flesh always has a backup plan. Let me tell you this. If you'll surrender to Christ tonight, you don't need a backup plan. Amen. You, you don't have to have a backup plan. If you'll put all your faith and trust in Him, there's no need to hold anything back because He's able. He's able. He can take care of you. The law was bondage. It was a curse because of man's inability to keep it. No man is justified by the law, Paul says, and the just shall live by faith. And the law was not of faith, but those who live, but those of faith will live by its principles. That means those people of faith, they're going to be keeping the law pretty much. They're going to be doing the right things. He tells us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law because he was made a curse for us. On Calvary, the sinless Lamb of God was slain for us that all the blessings and the promises made to Abraham might be revealed and, and, and come to the Gentiles by faith. That's what all of that was about. The law, couldn't get the law couldn't give life. It was unable to give us life. It concluded that everyone is under sin. But there was a promise given to all of those who would believe in faith about Jesus Christ. If we will just believe in faith and come in faith like Abraham did, then we can be saved. We can be delivered from that bondage that we were in. As children of God, Paul says we are baptized into God. We put on Christ and we become heirs according to the promise. God don't just let us in as somebody he picked up on the side of the road, but he says, come here, son and daughter, sit at my table. Right? It's not just that he had mercy on us and let us just, you know, straggle in and live out in the woodshed. You want to get to sit at the master's table as a son or a daughter of God. So you want to try and earn your way? Or you want to take what Christ gives you by faith? I think Paul's putting together a pretty good argument here that, that we need to just, just believe and just trust and quit all this mess of trying to earn everything and, and, and think that we can be good enough because we can't. Bless y'all. I hope y'all have had a good night.
Uh, it's tickling my heart. This is some of the best stuff that I'd, uh, I'd uh, love to be able to teach and preach about. Because if you understand how Abraham got saved, then you'll know exactly how it was you got saved. The same way, by grace through faith. You believe something a little different. You believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it's still by grace through faith that you come and were able to be saved. So bless all of you and all of you at home. We hope to be able to see you back here again soon sometime. Y'all have a good evening.